Greetings, friends. Welcome again. Sovereign Grace Doctrine, where our Lord and Savior is our Sovereign. We're saved by His grace, and it is from His doctrine, the doctrine of God's Word, we preach to you and teach to you the things of God. And even though we're talking about history in this series of studies, we're also talking to you about the doctrinal changes that were brought into the world by false religions and false teachers that you might know and understand what the truth is and when things changed. And I don't care what people want to say about early church fathers and things of this matter. Early church fathers are not the Word of God. They're not inspired. And uh, those things that are taught by them are not necessarily right. Neither are the things that are taught by many of the other religions and teachers out there in the world today. But it's only the Word of God is the final rule of faith and authority for all of us that we should go by. We are in this 12th century and we'll be here for a while. There are many false doctrines, errors are introduced in this time, yes, by Catholicism. We're still talking about baptism. And we're here in the book of Acts, chapter 2, and on the day of Pentecost, some 15 or so nations of people speak of hearing the Word of God in their own native language that day proclaimed unto them. My friends, it's the will of God to send the gospel to all the nations of the world, not in English, but in their languages. But to us that speak English, it has come to us in English. And of the English Bibles, there is none more accurate and more perfect than the King James Bible. Uh, you gainsayers, you deceivers, I don't care what you have to say. All your proofs can be shown to be wrong, misleading. You put your faith in someone out here that says, Oh, I've read those manuscripts. And I know them better than anybody else, and I'm telling you this is what they believe. And we put our faith also, well, we put our faith in the Word of God, but we also see these others who say, we've read it also, and we say, yes, the King James is right. Now, we can all use our lexicons and concordances and things and try to prove one side or the other. We say to the many deceivers out there that want to lead you away from the truth and the Word of God, this word baptize comes straight out of the Greek. It's baptizo, and it means to immerse. And any other form of baptism, sprinkling, pouring, do, does not show forth the same meaning. It doesn't show forth the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It doesn't show forth your death and burial to the old way of life, the old man, and the rebirth to the new. These things on the day of Pentecost, there in Acts chapter 2, and from verse 37 going on forth here where we were at last week, or last time, where again he said unto them, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Take note, it says they were pricked in their heart. That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God moving upon them and showing them their lost, undone condition. These who were spiritually discerned, not able to comprehend and understand what was being said, except the Holy Spirit of God moved upon them and pricked their hearts and caused them to realize here that that Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified on that cross was crucified for their sins. He suffered and died for them. He was buried in the grave for them. And he arose, my friends, for them and for us who believe upon him unto salvation. Peter said unto them, Repent. That's what's needful first. After we've heard the word of God, we've hearing, uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, people need to hear the gospel. They don't need to hear about your church. They don't need to hear about baptism. They don't need to hear about the Holy Spirit. 
They don't need to hear about any of the doctrine that's taught in the Word of God. They need to hear about their need to repent. Jesus came to call sinners, my friends, He came to call sinners to repentance. And if you've got a Bible that's removed that statement out of its text, you need to throw that book away and go get you a real Bible. These modern translations are taking away the need for repentance. We were called to repent from our walk of life, our sinful way of life, wherein we lived, wherein we were content. All of us were content to be there. Didn't mean we were happy. Didn't mean we were satisfied. Those who live and dwell in a sinful life, they're never satisfied. They can never have enough. They can never have a lot, enough of what their eyes are set upon, what they're trying to grab hold of in this life. They'll never be satisfied. But we find a satisfaction and a joy in the salvation of the Lord that passeth all understanding. But he said repent and be baptized. Repent and then be baptized. you got to get the order right. You have to be old enough first to understand that you're a sinner and that you need to repent, and the Holy Spirit of God has to impress you with that, show you that, that you are a sinner, and first of all, you have a sinful nature, and you've inherited that from Adam. But you're not condemned to hell because of Adam's sin. This original sin doctrine is all messed up. It teaches the wrong thing. We're not condemned to hell because of Adam's sin. We're condemned to hell because of our own sins. The nature, the sinful nature doesn't condemn us. Well, we're lost and undone, yes. But there is no condemnation until we get old enough to understand our life and our condition before God and that we are sinners first, yes, by nature. But we become sinners by practice very quickly in this life. You can't avoid it. No one can live without being a sinner. We all have a varying degree of sinfulness within us, even after we're saved. But we heard the gospel Holy Spirit of God has pricked our hearts, moved us in repentance, and we have repented. We've turned to God. We've seek, We've sought God. We've uh, we've drawn nigh unto God because of the working the power of God in us already that has moved upon us and pricked our hearts. And that wooing call, that effectual call of God, has drew us to Him. Oh, I got it on my own. I did it on my own. My friends, don't glorify yourself in this. I see way too many that do that. They want to glorify themselves. Oh, i got to have a little pride in this. i got to say, I got it. I went and got it myself. You cannot get that which must be given. You cannot do anything to get it. You cannot earn it. You cannot work for it. It's by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone, plus or minus nothing. You're saved before you ever come to the understanding you need to be baptized. God saves you. He gives you repentance and faith hand in hand. They come hand in hand together. One who truly repents is believing, and one who truly believes is repenting. You can't have one without the other. To give you an example, and that is the uh, demons and the devils. They believe. Are they saved? No. They're still where they're at. They're still under the judgment of God. They believe in Him. Because they've seen Him. They have a belief that's based on first-hand knowledge, first-hand seeing. We haven't seen him yet. Our faith is based off what we haven't seen, but yet we know is there and it'll be fulfilled. Having repented and believed the gospel, you then be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are baptized in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost. That is what he told them to do. Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter. We're all baptized under the same Christ and the same God. And then we also, the Holy Spirit of God has, that has pricked our hearts, is also that which quickens and makes us alive and dwells within us. And in those early days, they just didn't have the Holy Spirit of God. They were overflowed with it at times. As the Holy Spirit of God worked in and through them to bring about miracles and declare prophecies and foreknowledge of things that would come to pass soon in their days. Many gifts and things which they had were related to these things, but they were not 
required for salvation. They were gifts given of God as it pleased God to whom so it pleased him to give it. He goes on to say, For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. First, the promise is unto you, to these people that he's speaking to there. He's saying the promise is unto you and to your children. He's speaking to the people of Israel. First off, it's unto them and to their children the hope of the Savior and the Messiah who would come and to all that are far off. And that includes us Gentiles. We were the ones that were far off. Strangers to the covenants of promise without God, without hope in the world. But praise be unto God, He's had mercy upon us too. And it is because they received Him not. They wouldn't have him to rule over them, so he's turned to the Gentiles to provoke these people, Israel, into jealousy. And in the fullness of time, he'll turn back to them, and he'll, at least 144,000, that will be set aside of God in those days during the Great Tribulation to preach the gospel. Even as many as he says, as the Lord our God shall call. My friends, too many want to leave God's hand out of this. They don't want to give him the glory that's his. So what about man's free will? What are you free to do but sin and to live in your darkness until the light of God and the gospel shines unto you and there's that doorway. There's that opportunity, but can you find the strength in yourself without His power to move through the door? I dare say not. For that old nature restrains you, and it does not want to move away from that place of satisfaction in a sinful life. It doesn't want to move you over through the door into Jesus Christ and His love. You are a slave to your old sinful nature. Unless the Holy Spirit of God breaks the chains, saves you, quickens you, makes you alive, gives you a new nature that desires to be in that light and to move to the light and to believe in the light, to believe in Christ, who are you glorifying? When you ought to be glorifying the Lord who hath called you with an everlasting call, it's all he's talking to Jews here. He's talking to Israel. All those that want to limit it to them are condemning themselves because unless God has mercy and calls you out of your sinful walk of life, you'll never turn from it. Paul declared these things also. That it is God who saves and calls us and who knew us. And who can separate us from the love of God? Nothing can. Not even ourselves. But he says, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untrod generation. In other words, he's saying, Repent. Repent from this wicked life and this wicked generation that you're living in. Not that they could literally save themselves. Christ is the one who saves. He is the one who saves us from all our sins. And it is that Holy Spirit of God who pricks our hearts and shows us Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And then Jesus shows us the Father, the Trinity. Then it says in verse 41, Then they that gladly received his word. I will say to you that one who is saved, one who is truly saved, has a joy in their heart to be set free from that ch the, set free from the chains and the bondage to an old sinful way of life, a way in where, yes, it, it would be said was pleasurable and things were, well, we enjoyed it. Sin's enjoyable. Yes, it is. But when one sees that hard, cold reality that the joys of sin will condemn you to an eternity in hell, only the Holy Spirit of God 
can give you a gladness to be free and set for, uh, to be set free from that and to be in the sinner in the will of God to now be a child of God who has a hope of an eternal life and glory with God and his son there where you will live not for your own desires and your own little estate and a little farm a little uh, cabin in the woods and place to fish and all these foolish ideas that people come up with but there we will live in eternity with God being his people and he being our God and we'll worship him forever and we will do his will forever. That will be the desire of our hearts to do everything that God wants to do. No matter whether we're farming, fishing, building things, or waging war. But these things won't exist anymore. War will not exist. There will be no more evil. There will be no more sin. There will only be peace, happiness, joy, the presence of a holy and righteous God. All some people say, oh, that just doesn't sound like fun. It doesn't sound, it doesn't sound like I'd enjoy it at all. No, you won't. Because you're a lost, undone sinner. And it doesn't appeal to you. The other state waits for you, and that's in a lake of fire, an eternity of suffering and sorrow in darkness, fully separated from the power and presence of God. You that don't want to believe upon Him, you that deny that He is, yeah, you'll eventually get free from him. You'll eventually find that place where God's not there to show you any compassion. You'll be, you'll be there in a place of suffering and agony and torment and gnashing of teeth that lasts forever and ever. And it will be just. Those that don't understand the justice of that are still lost and done in their sins. And they know not our God. But they that gladly received his word, the preaching of the gospel, the teaching of the things of God, they gladly received the message that they were sinners, that they were an ungodly people, that needed to repent and believe upon him for their salvation. And not only that, but they gladly received the idea that they should submit themselves, my friends, unto baptism. And to follow him in that and everything else then it was taught unto them. Those that are not willing to follow through on these things, there's something wrong with you. Still some stubbornness there. Still some stiff-heartedness there. To where that you don't want to yield yourself unto what God says to do. You want to go do your own thing. Oh, I want to go over here in my own little corner of the world and... I'll raise my voice to God the way I choose. I'll celebrate and uh, worship Him the way I choose. When God says by His word we're to do thus and so. And if you're not willing to do what Christ said, then you don't have the love of God that you ought to have for Him. Because He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You'll keep what I've taught you. And all some think, well, it's just ten commandments over here. that We just need to live by those commandments. And then we're free to do anything else we want beyond that. No, we're to submit ourselves unto baptism. We're to be baptized by immersion. We're to be lowered in the water and then raised back up out of that water by the proper official that is a true New Testament Baptist church. No, it doesn't have to be called Baptist. But it'd be a true New Testament church. They're known by many names throughout history. Baptism, a Baptist is just a doctrine. It's just a way of believing and really it is associated with the believer's baptism. By, by, by saying we're Baptist, we're saying we believe in, be in believer's baptism. Uh, or others, we'll get to them out here eventually in time in this. But you still have in the world today, you have the uh, Waldenses are still out there. We, uh, we spoke about them here just a couple weeks ago now. Uh, we're thankful for those who have enjoyed that. And the great, the high numbers have, uh, have been appealed by that. They've, they've sought that out. But those Waldenses were known by many different names. And they're connected in line of those Anabaptists. All those Anabaptists going out throughout history all held to these things. They believed in believers' baptism. They believed in immersion. They believed you should be dunked under water. And they died for that belief. 
all these others that believe these other false ways murdered them, tried to shut them up. The history shows the more they fought them, the more they tried to shut them up, the more of them there were. God blessed his churches and he said you'll be persecuted. You'll be hated because they hated me and they'll hate you. And they were hated. And the more they were hated, the more they killed them, the more of them they found there were. It's like trying to put a fire out. The more, you got there, the more they got there and stomped on the fire, the more it spread. They could not put out the fire of the gospel. They could not stop these doctrines from being taught. Now, my friends, it goes on here. Uh, again, they were glad to receive the word of God, and they were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. About 3,000 people saved that day. It would take a little while to baptize that number of people, now wouldn't it? But you got at least 12 here. 12 here, uh, 12 apostles at this point that are able to baptize. 12, uh, 3,000 divided by 12. Roughly, you can figure that up if you want to. But it's just a matter of dunk them under water and bring them back up. Dunk them under the water and bring them back up. as one by one of the file in line. It could have been done. God would provide the water to do it. I know that they did. They had the River Jordan there. Other sources of water. Doesn't have to be done in a, water, in a river. Doesn't have to be done in running water. Just has to be done in water. It could have been done in those baptistries that were Christians began to build and still have today. But my friends, these things are established. We're showing them through history here how that people believe these things and they died for them. And it's those that hated them that killed them. Nowhere in the scriptures did God tell us to go out and kill anyone because of what they believe. No matter whether they profess to be a Christian or they don't profess to be a Christian, they could be of any other, they could be a Jew, a Hindu, they could be of Islam, all the other religions of the world, God does not tell us anywhere to go out here and kill any of them because of what they believe. We're just to go preach to them the gospel. And those that gladly receive it then, we're to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then we begin to teach those that have been baptized, we begin to teach them the all things of God. That's the proper pattern set before us in scriptures that we're to do. Now moving on to Acts chapter 8. We have here the story of Philip and the Ethiopian. And uh, starting there in verse uh, chapter 8 and verse 32 it says, The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb done before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation for this, for, for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this, or of himself, or of some other man. And Philip opened his mouth. And began at that same scripture to preach unto him Jesus. That's out of Isaiah. He began to preach out of Isaiah the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll say, I'll tell you this. You won't, there's something you won't find over there in that. Or you'll find a perfect picture of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, of his suffering and of his death. But you won't find baptism. You won't find baptism. So how does he go from this then and... Philip preaching him the gospel out of that. And he says, And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And Enoch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? When there's no water over there in Isaiah. Now, I guess Philip could have mentioned it by this point, but I kind of think maybe he hadn't yet. But there is certainly the very likely possibility that he was aware, the eunuch was aware of what had come to pass and what was being noised in all the city and all round about of the death and burial of this Jesus of Nazareth and about how that now that there was this uh, commotion in the city and of a gospel being preached and of people submitting themselves unto baptism in the water. 
and how that it was connected to this one called Jesus of Nazareth. And here he began to declare unto him Jesus of Nazareth, and he already knows, he's heard already from other different sources. And also possibly, yes, Philip said that repent and be baptized. But this eunuch hears it and believes. He believes upon this one who he's told about, this Jesus of Nazareth, and this perfect picture here out of Isaiah of our Lord and our Savior. And he says, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Now this too is changed in many modern English translations. But there's very clear understanding set before us here, my friends, that the eunuch believed that there could be something that hinders a person from being baptized. And there is. For Philip says unto him in verse 37, and many of your Bibles don't have this, but Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. It's very clearly showing that the necessity of belief must be there first for one to be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And the faith of another won't do it for you, my friends. I don't care what some want to say. That's not based off scriptures. It's not based off the Word of God. He said, if thou believest. Philip could have said, well, you know, I believe upon him, and because I believe, I'll baptize you, and that'll be good enough. No, he said, if thou believest, you must believe. Each of us of individuals must, and we had to believe for us to then be baptized in the water. But if we believe, he said, if thou believest all thine heart, you may. We must believe. We must be able to believe. And along with that belief comes a repent of heart toward God. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Let me say to you, you need to believe that he is the Son of God. And we understand this too, that he is the only begotten Son of God. There are, he has many sons. God truly has many sons. But there's only one that is the only begotten Son. The rest of us are adopted into the family. Jesus of Nazareth is that one, and it says, And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down into the water, both of them, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. He immersed him in the water, and it came out. That's the picture here. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Assos, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. My friends, it's the glorious truth of the gospel that has gone forth unto all the world, and to as many as have believed upon him have then been baptized and if you haven't been, if it wasn't done that order, then it wasn't done rightly. And you need to be baptized again if it hasn't been done rightly. And we'll prove that. We could prove that to you from the scriptures too. But that is a proper form of baptism. And next time, friends, we'll move on to the next error that we find in that century. We pray God would bless you and keep you in the truth, my friends. Study. Study the Word of God.